He was a famous trumpet man from all Chicago way. He had a boogie style that no one else could play. He was a top man at his craft. But then his number came up and he was gone with the draft. He's in the army now, a blowing reveille. He's the boogie woogie bugle boy of Company B. Hi, everybody. Today we're going to talk about the war in Europe, how it started, and sort of the methods of the war. Um, so we're working with um, US 59 today. Um, identify and locate on a map the major allied and Axis countries, um, major threats of the war. Um, so we're working more with the major threats of the war in the notes, and then you'll do the math after the notes. So the main questions you're going to be answering today. What alliances existed during World War II? What were Germany's first steps towards war? How did the rest of Europe react to Germany's aggression? Um, what did Germany do to actually start World War II? And what events led to the start of World War II? Okay, so first thing I know is what the sides were, right? What are the, what are the teams, as someone in the other class said? Um, so the Allied powers, okay, um, at the by the end of it all, you have the Great Britain, the Soviet Union, France, China, the United States, and Italy. Okay. Now, for most of the war, it's the Great Britain, France. They're the main two. Okay. China, kind of, but China is just focusing on killing Japan. They don't care about everybody else. Um, the United States joins in 1941 after Pearl Harbor. The Soviet Union joins after Hitler turns on them. Um, and Italy joins once they once Mussolini is kicked out of power and then killed. By the way, anybody know how Mussolini was killed? They hung him from the rafters of a gas station. That is like the perfect death of a dictator. I just love it. Okay. Uh, the Axis powers, what, what most Americans consider the bad guys during this war. Um, you have Germany. Italy, while Mussolini was in power, and Japan. Okay, those are the big three. Um, the Soviet Union was never technically part of the Axis powers, but the Soviet Union was working with Germany for a little bit there at the beginning, and we're going to talk about that. Um, as far as what Ger what Germany is doing to kind of get ready for war, um, as we talked about this in the last set of notes, they take Austria and Czechoslovakia. Okay, so Austria, um, most Austrians were of German descent. They considered themselves German. Uh, most Austrians wanted to unify with Germany. So on March 12, 1938, German troops marched into Austria to occupy it. And a lot of them were met with cheers by the Austrians. The Austrians wanted that. So most of the rest of Europe is going to let them take Austria because it looks like that's what Austria wants. Um, Czechoslovakia is different. Okay. Um, the Sudetenland, okay, Sudetenland was part of Germany originally. Czechoslovakia was created after World War I, and they wanted a barrier between themselves and Germany. So they were given a strip of mountains that used to be German called the Sudetenland. Um, and Hitler claims uh, that the Czechs are ambushing the Germans, which is stupid. Why would the little kids pick on the big kids? Um, but uh, he claims that the Czechs are ambushing the Germans so that he can march into the Sudetenland and take the Sudetenland. Okay. Um, he marches in and takes it. Um, and then he says, we want the Sudetenland. And people say, okay, we'll let them take it. That's fine. Um, this is whenever Neville Chamberlain does his piece in our time. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay. Um, and then like a week after Hitler says, we've got the Sudetenland, we're happy. Um, Hitler takes the rest of Czechoslovakia. Okay. Because what Hitler was really after, it wasn't just getting the lands German had, Germany had before World War I. Hitler was after what he called Liebenstrom. Okay. Which is German for living space. He wanted land so that this new German empire he's creating of ethnic Germans could spread out and have more land and control it. Okay. That, so more land means more control of natural resources. Um, September 30th, 1938, Germany gets the Sudetenland. Okay. Um, under the Munich agreement, which was negotiated in large part by Neville Chamberlain. Okay. Um, which is, we're going to talk about this now. Okay. Um, Britain and France, they're just going to keep giving in to Hitler over and over and over again because they don't want to fight another war. 
Um, this policy is known as appeasement. When you appease somebody, um, you give up something you believe in. You give up your principles in order to pacify someone to shut them up. Um, most parents don't agree in giving kids what they want because they're whining, right? But every parent has given a kid a cookie to shut the kid up every once in a while. Everyone's done it, right? Here's a cookie. Go play for a while. Just give me five minutes of peace and quiet. Okay. Everyone's done it. It's called appeasement. It's a, it, but it, it's a bad thing when countries start doing it. Right. Um, Neville Chamberlain, he is the prime minister of England and, uh, Edward Daldier. Okay. Which was the French premier. Um, they are both going to let Hitler get away with taking the Sudetenland in that Munich agreement. As a matter of fact, Neville Chamberlain was so excited that he had avoided a war with Germany that when he comes back with the Munich Agreement, right, um, he has this giant speech on the tarmac outside of the plane. Like he doesn't even make it back to Parliament. He has this speech right outside the plane where he waves the Munich Agreement in his hand and he declares, we will have peace in our time, right? You can thank me. We have avoided a war. You're welcome. Okay. Um, and of course, you know, he says, you know, Hitler's agreed to stop uh, all of his aggression. All he wanted was, was the Sudetenland. He gets to keep the Sudetenland and he's going to stop now. Waves that piece of paper, right? Less than a month later, Hitler has invaded the rest of Czechoslovakia and taken over Czechoslovakia. So, I mean, that, that paper's not... that that agreement's not worth the paper it's written on. But Neville Chamberlain decided that that was the way to go instead of stepping up with the military and stopping Hitler. Um, Winston Churchill was an up and coming um, British uh, politician. Um, and he says he's against the Munich agreement from the start. He says Britain and France had to choose between war and dishonor. They chose dishonor they will have war, right? So he says they had to choose between standing for what they believe in and standing for principles and going to war to defend those principles or dishonoring themselves and giving up everything they believe in. They chose to dishonor themselves and give up everything they believe in to avoid a war, but they're going to get the war anyway because Hitler's not going to stop. You're going to have to go in and stop him. Um, and Winston Churchill, Neville Chamberlain gets booted out of office. Um, Winston Churchill gets elected and he becomes the new prime minister of England. So he will be the prime minister of, of England through most of World War II. Um, you're going to see lots of pictures of him. He's always smoking cigars. You'll see lots of him doing the V. Okay. It's not a peace sign when he does it. Okay. It is V for victory. Okay. Um. As far as the Soviet Union and Hitler go, um, they got together before the war started and they signed what was called the Soviet-German Non-Aggression Pact. A non-aggression pact is an agreement not to attack each other, okay? So Hitler and Stalin promised not to attack each other for 10 years, okay? And then they have secretly agreed that when the war started, they would both attack Poland and they would divide it up. And Hitler would get Western Poland, the part of Poland that was on the border of Germany, and Soviet Union would get Eastern Poland, which was the, the part of Poland that was on the border of the Soviet Union. Um, so uh, you've got this political cartoon, right? Dead Poland between them. The scum of the earth, I believe. The bloody assassin of workers, I presume, right? You hate each other, but we're going to agree to to not fight each other, okay? And they did hate each other because communism and fascism are two total opposites as far as what they believe in. When, they're, when you actually see them work in real life, they look very similar. But on paper, what, they, what their values are, are complete opposites. So... Um, what do they get out of this? Why are they signing this, right? If they hate each other, why are they doing this? You need to know this, write this down. Um, Hitler from the non-aggression pack gets to avoid a two front war. Okay. That was Germany's big problem in world war one was they had to divide their troops and fight on two different fronts. 
So by keeping the Soviet Union out of it, he is avoiding a two-front war. He can throw everything he has at France. Whew, excuse me. Um, and Stalin gets two things, right? Stalin gets breathing room, right? They get that chunk of Poland to act as a buffer between Germany and the Soviet Union. So when these two turn on each other, because they both knew they were going to turn on each other, right? This was, nobody expected this to actually last 10 years. Um, but now Stalin has this buffer zone of Poland. So whenever the war between Soviet Union and Germany happens, it happens in Poland and not in the Soviet Union. Okay. So Poland is the land that's getting destroyed. That's the first thing Stalin gets. The second thing Stalin gets is time. He now has a little bit of time that he can use to build up that buffer between him and Hitler and to build up his military. Okay. So they, they each get something out of this. Okay. So what did Germany do that actually starts World War II? What, what was the straw that the rest of Europe said, okay, we're done with appeasement. We're going to war. Anybody know? They invaded Poland. Okay. September 1st, 1939, Hitler invaded Poland without warning. There's no declaration of war. Um, Hitler just marches into Poland. Okay. Um, Great Britain and France both declare war on Germany and World War II has officially begun. Okay. Now this is where it gets tricky. Hitler fought as a soldier in World War I. Okay. So he understood the problems with trench warfare. He did not want trench warfare. He wanted fast war because he understood the second you slow down and the second you start digging trenches, then the war is going to last much, much longer and more people are going to die. So he invented a new type of war. He called it Blitzkrieg or lightning war. Um, it was very fast paced and it was dependent upon machines. Okay. So what you would do is you would use the Luftwaffe. The Luftwaffe was the, the German air force. Okay. Um, they would soften the enemy, right? So they would fly through first and just drop bombs everywhere. Okay. Um, which would weaken the enemy army, make it easier to attack. Okay. Then fast moving mechanized forces would overwhelm and encircle the enemy. So they would break the enemy's lines and they would encircle them. Okay. So they would keep the, they would break the enemy lines. So you're not fighting one massive army. You're fighting very small pockets of army. Um, and you would encircle, you would flank them. So you're fighting them on all sides. Okay. And you're going to use tanks, other armored vehicles for this. Um, so you've got the Luftwaffe would fly over and soften them up. And then you have tanks and other armored vehicles that would very quickly march in and encircle. And uh, then the troops would come in behind and basically pick everybody off. Okay. Um, so everyone expected, write this down, everyone expected after the invasion of Poland that Hitler would attack France. Like everyone's expecting him to attack France. Only he doesn't right away. Um, for a couple of months, Hitler wages what's called the Sitzkrieg, S-I-T-Z-K-R-I-E-G, which um, was called the Sitting War. Um, he basically, after he takes Poland, he takes a minute to regroup. He gets his army back where it needs to be. Um, he, he, he works on that high morale of just taking Poland, and he prepares to invade France, but he doesn't actually do it yet. Okay. Uh, which is why um, France doesn't fall until later on in the year. Okay. Um, the fall of France. Um, when they do attack France, um, they're going to just kind of roll over uh, the, Ma the Maginot line. Okay. Uh, or the Maginot, depending on how French you are. Okay. Uh, the Maginot line, um, it was an old relic of trench warfare. Um, the French built this massive weaponized barricaded trench, basically defensive line along the coast of, or coast, along the border of Germany and France. 
Um, and it was supposed to keep France from being invaded. And it doesn't. Right? Hitler's got a new type of warfare. He's just going to roll right over it. Um, and the British and French soldiers that have showed up to fight this war, they they are now in, forced to retreat or die. Right? Um, the German troops push the French and British soldiers um, north to the northern coast of France to a tiny little place called Dunkirk. And they are on the beaches of Dunkirk and they're all about to die. And there's no way to get them out because the, the waters at Dunkirk are too narrow or too uh, shallow for great big battleships to be, you know, sailing in. Plus, the, there's just not enough, there's not enough Navy boats to get everybody out. So Winston Churchill does something kind of awesome. He goes on the radio in, in Britain and he tells people, we got boys over in France who are going to die if we can't get them out. And right now we can't get them out. We need help. And you have the volunteer fleet at Dunkirk where British soldiers, because the, the if you remember on your map, France and and sorry, France and Britain are really close together. It's just that shallow little body of water called the English Channel between them. So, you know, hundreds of British soldiers take their own private boats and sail them across to Dunkirk because private boats can go in the shallow waters because they're not as heavy. They're not as big as big military vessels. So, you I mean, you have fishing vessels, you have yachts, you have people brought rowboats for God's sake. Uh, so anything they could find to get in there and get these troops and over 800 vessels, um, uh, most of them piloted by their owners are going to shuttle 300,000 British and French troops um, across the channel to England. Um, here's a picture of it. Okay. So, I mean, like you can see this, like this is obviously not a military boat, right? It has a sail. Okay. So you're going to see a lot of these kind of private citizens boats, just grabbing whoever they can grab and taking them out. Okay. Um, as far as the battle of Britain goes, um, battle of Britain happens in the summer of 1940 and it was Hitler's plan or Germany's plan to prepare England for invasion. Remember we talked about the Luftwaffe softening up, softening up people. Well, the battle of Britain is a systematic bombing of Britain. Um, uh, the, the, you know, 24 hours a day at random times during the day, the Luftwaffe would fly across the channel and bomb the heck out of England. Okay. Um, and the only reason why they were be able to be held off was because the German air or sorry, the British air force was one, not small. Britain had invested money in its air force and it had a big air force. The Royal air force was, was good. Um, and two, they had a new technology. They had radar. Okay. Um, and radar is going to allow them to see these planes coming, give people warning to get, to get down to the shelters and it gives them time to scramble their Spitfires and their Hurricanes, their own fighting jets, their own fighting planes. Okay. Um, and you're going to have this, these large dog fights that happen in the air above Britain. And, I'm, and there's a video I'm going to show you about that. Um, so Britain's ability to stand up to these Nazis is going to frustrate Hitler. And Hitler's never going to be able to do a land war in England the way he planned on it. Um, so whenever Hitler can't, go after England the way he wants to. This is going to be what, what leads him to turn on the Soviet Union and attack the Soviet Union earlier than he probably would have otherwise. All right, and that's it for today.